As the executive pastor from Kingdom Life Fellowship, welcome you to our facility here. And uh, just very briefly, I wanted to mention that I often wondered why it was that after many years of being single, Naomi agreed to marry me. And I think it was because of mom, because Naomi prepared me to meet her the first time and said, you know, over these many years that I've been single, mom has never liked one of my suitors, one of the men that was around, and she just never would agree to any of them. And she was warning me, because she's not going to like you either, but don't take it personally. It, it's just mom. She doesn't like anybody. And uh, mom liked me so much, she called Benet and asked her to call Lauren and, and get me some guava pastry. From It was a big surprise. So I have a special tie to this lady over the years. And I'm glad you all are here to celebrate her life, and welcome. We're glad you're here. When Colby and I were leaving for Oklahoma last year, Grandma wrote me a letter that included her favorite scripture. Caitlin and I read this letter as a prayer every day as we made that drive halfway across the country for our big move. The letter and these verses became an important part of our journey to Oklahoma, and I decided to frame Grandma's letter that showed her perfect handwriting. This frame now sits on our nightstand as a reminder of Grandma's love for us and God's promise. Grandma was solid in her faith, and that is something I will always remember and admire. This is something I will cherish and hope to continue as a part of her legacy. Grandma's favorite scripture, Psalm 23, reads, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we have this service for Barbara Serikaku, we want to first of all thank you for the privilege that each one of us have had of knowing her. She was an awesome and wonderful mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and Christian friend. And even though we are saddened that she is not with us today, Lord, we know that because of her faith and trust in Jesus, that this is just a temporary state and that one day we will be able to see and meet with her again. We invite you to be with us in this service. May your Holy Spirit of hope and comfort be with us all. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Personal History, <clears throat> a river metaphor of the Arakawa family. The headwaters. The name Arakawa means new river, and it meandered through rough waters, rapids, waterfalls, and peaceful, calm waters. Its headwaters begins in Onaha, Nishihara, Okinawa in the year 1880. This is the year that Taru and Kama were born. Later, they, got, they met and got married. Soon the river became a rapid with rough waters as many Okinawans left their home for a better life abroad in 1908. Taru and Ma, uh, Taru Arakawa immigrated to Hawaii, leaving his family in Okinawa to seek employment in the pineapple fields of Kahalu, Oahu. Kama, his wife, left Okinawa, leaving her three children, Ushi, Kama, and Kukama, with relatives when they joined their, her husband in 1911 to work in the pineapple fields. After working for several years, they had enough money to bring their children to Hawaii in 1919. Later, they moved to Paia, Maui. Tributary one, Ushi, the son of Taru and Kama Arakawa, met a beautiful, hard-working woman named Kami Arakawa, no relation. And here, two new rivers met at a tributary junction and flowed as one as they got married in 1920. This oneness produced eight children to the Arakawa family, Barbara, Howard, Alice, Roy, Kiyoshi, Harold, Kenneth, and Winnie. Today, only Harold and Winnie are the survivors of the Arakawa family. Barbara Ayako Arakawa was born in November, on November 26, 1922 in Paia, Maui. Being the firstborn in the family brought tremendous responsibility to Barbara at a very early age. In Japanese culture, the firstborn daughter is given the title of Nesang, it is a significant title because it assumes the power of authority and respect from all siblings in the household. You're in essence the surrogate mother and the burden of contributing to the survival of a family becomes your responsibility. The flow of the river became rough, waters over rocks and boulders. Barbara had to sacrifice her education at the eighth grade level. And at the age of 14, she had to find employment in the sugarcane fields in Paia, Maui to supplement the family income. Tributary two. In 1938, 39, Barbara arrived at another tri tributary junction. Mrs. Nakamoto, a call porter from the Paia SDA church, convinced Pastor Weber's wife to start a cooking class for girls in the sugar plantation town of Paia. Mrs. Nakamoto is Amy Obata's mother. After cooking class ended, she started a Bible studies class with the girls. Only two of the girls who started the Bible class became members of the SDA church, Myrna Tyra and my mother-in-law, Barbara. They were the only members of their respective families to become Adventists, so soon it created some problems within the families. Their families expected their decision the families expect, uh, respected their decisions and allowed them to practice their faith. So the flow of the river was not as rough 
except for some minor twists and turns. Tributary 3. In 1941, the Arakawa family moved to Kaalu'u on Oahu, where they settled at the hygienic dairy. Here, Ushi, or cow, worked on the dairy farm working with cows. It was here that another tributary junction in the life of Barbara took place. A handsome young man named Kiyoshi Serikaku worked on the dairy farm and soon fell in love with Barbara. The Serikaku and the Arakawa rivers merged at this junction and soon they were married on April 4, 1943. Education was very, very important to them and they both enrolled in adult education classes and earned their high school diplomas. This motivated and encouraged their children to pursue a college education. Eileen attended PUC, became a teacher, and later an administrative secretary, and retired working at the School of Medicine Alumni Association. Naomi attended PUC, completed her medical technology program at Loma Linda, and retired at the VA hospital in Loma Linda. Kurt attended La Sierra University, completed his ultrasound technician training from Loma Linda, and is currently employed in that department at Loma Linda. After her children were gone, she found employment at Castle Medical Center in Kailu, Hawaii, and became supervisor for the housekeeping department where she retired. While working at Castle, her joy was giving gardenias she grew at home to her fellow workers and supervising the students who came to the department for service credit. Kiyoshi, Arakaku, uh, Kiyoshi Sirakaku passed away on April 25th, 1983 at the age of 64. Barbara Arakawa Sirakaku passed away on October 13, 2013 at the age of 90. Both went to sleep in the Lord in Loma Linda in the city the Spanish called Beautiful Hill. They leave behind three children, six grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Yes, the Arakawa Serikaku River will continue to flow in the lives of her three children, six grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren until we reach the heavenly river, the beautiful heavenly city. Then the angel showed me the river, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of nations. Revelation 22, 1 to 3. Nesang Baba, Barbara, you are the bridge between the first generation and the third generation and beyond. You carry in your memories all the history of our links to the past, its language, its music, its culture, and our ancestors. You, you represent all the Nesangs who followed a similar path of hardship and carried the burdens of families. You represent all who love and trust their God and one day shall meet at the beautiful, the beautiful river. Yes, we will gather at the river. Soon this will be a celebration of Barbara's life but now I would like to sort of transition to memories, if you don't mind, because um, I live with my mother-in-law for 15 years. In closing, just a brief uh, perspective of who my mother-in-law was. Um, I have a good perspective, perspective of her because, um, as I said, I live with her for 15 years. Being Nesang, she assumed the role of a sergeant as dictated by birth order. Although she had, fused, she had a fused joint in her right leg and had a left leg shorter by two inches, you had to move fast to keep up with her. She never let her hardship deter her from what she wanted to accomplish. And I'm sure this theme will probably run through all the memories because um, she traveled a lot. Myrna uh, Tyra confided in me that when she went on a trip with Barbara, she had to hang on to her because she fearlessly went everywhere. As it will be shown in the slides, she went to every continent except Antarctica. Uh, we're including uh, Egypt as part of Africa. When, when we uh, first moved here for two Redlands from Hawaii, um, 
Barbara needed to visit the Kaiser Clinic on Redlands Boulevard. Uh, I wasn't sure where the clinic was located, having just arrived in the area. But here she was, sitting in the front seat next to me. And she began to direct my driving. Uh, Turn right, she asserted in her Sergeant Nissan way, Nissan way. I meekly conformed because she was Nissan to me. Soon we, we were in the heart of downtown Redlands. Uh, uh, Grandma, uh, where's the, uh, the clinic, I inquired. She didn't say a word. Stopping randomly, I asked people on the road in the middle of uh, Redlands, uh, is there a Kaiser Clinic uh, around here in downtown? They all shook their heads and acknowledged that they knew of no clinic in the area. And so I raced home as fast as I could, found the phone book, found the address, and raced down to Redlands Boulevard, exceeding the speed, speed limit, knowing that we were late for the appointment. Uh, this sums up my mother-in-law. automatic climber. You don't need talk and stuff going to happen. And you just gotta let them and the stuff just waiting for when you ready.
people passing by. I see friends shaking and singing. How do you do? They really say, I, I love you. I hear babies cry and I watch them go. They'll learn much more. Everybody gonna save to yourself. Make the kulia on a pono for help the other. And when you make the kulia on a, you know, pono, then it's going. It's like kind of automatic kind of. You don't need talk and stuff going going happen. And you just gotta let them and the stuff just waiting for when you ready. In the sky, how so on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking and singing. How do you do? They really say, I, I love you. I love you. I hear babies cry. Oh.
beauty in the sky are also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, singing, How do you do? They really sing, I, I love you. I was a tour guide for many people from Loma Linda to Japan, and often some from Los Angeles and Hawaii would join us. On one tour, Barbara joined us and she made the trip unforgettable. One day we were all gathered before a lovely fruit stand in Osaka. All felt that the prices were too high, especially the one fruit that they all wanted to buy. The group decided not to buy. However, there was one exception. Barbara bought the special fruit. After washing it, she pulled out a cutting board and knife from her handbag. <laughs> she cut the fruit in many pieces and gave a piece to all who wanted to taste it. This unusual, thoughtful, kind deed opened the eyes of her fellow travelers. Some wanted to know more about Barbara. They soon discovered that she had a good mind and preferred to listen rather than talk and preferred to serve rather than be served. Few saw that she was also a very observant person. She loved the beautiful flowers and plants of Japan. The tour group appreciated and respected Barbara. Gratitude was Barbara's virtue I appreciated the most. First, Barbara was always grateful for God's unconditional love, for Christ's death on the cross, and for all the wonderful promises of the Bible. Secondly, she was thankful for her family her children, grandchildren, and the sons and daughters-in-law law in the family. Thirdly, she loved the members of God's family. All her favorite friends loved Jesus. Friends give us a taste of heaven on earth. Barbara experienced heaven because her heart was full of gratitude every day for her family and friends. Praise God for the price for the life of Barbara Serikaku. May God bless and comfort the families of Eileen, Naomi, and Kurt. My name is Robin Stevens just in case it's not clear, since there's going to be two beautiful women up here on the podium reading about memories for Grandma. My earliest memories of my grandma are from the Hawaii trips that my family made around Christmas time each year. She and Grandpa, as well as the rest of our family in Hawaii, would meet us at the airport with either flour or what I called Hawaiian candy lays, because they were all a cracked seed and you could only get them in Hawaii. And since I was on California time, 
I was often up early in the mornings at the beginning of our trips. And so I remember her cooking breakfast for my grandpa before he left for his job at the dairy across the island. And I remember that she always made him eggs, hot dogs, and rice. If I was there, then she would make me some, too. And he liked to eat everything with shoyu or soy sauce, but she would give me ketchup with mine so that I could eat all my stuff. And um, she didn't drink a lot of juice, if I remember correctly, but if we were there, then she could always kept juice in the house. And so I would get to have orange passion, which is my absolute favorite. And it is one of my favorite breakfasts to this day. Um, so that was a wonderful memory. While we were there, I also liked to go into her bedroom and do two things. I liked to look at the wedding picture of her and Grandpa, and I must have drove her crazy by making her bring out that wedding picture every single time I went into that room. And then I also liked to smell her perfumes. My favorite one was in a little donkey-shaped bottle of clear gray glass, and when it was almost gone, to my complete joy and excitement, she let me have it. And so every time I smelled it, I would think of her. And I still have that little bottle somewhere in my things. <clears throat> At the end of those trips, we would take home jars of her homemade guava jelly. It was the best jelly in the world. I couldn't understand why kids at my school liked strawberry and grape because there was guava jelly available, I thought. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was such a wonderful treat at the time. And when she came to visit us in California, she showed us her love by bringing us a Guava cake from Delight Bakery, so it was always extra special when she came. I didn't know it until I was older, but <clears throat> she would go to the bakery the day before, and she would buy a cake, and sometimes she would freeze it, sometimes she wouldn't, and she would carry that cake on her lap all the way on the airplane across so that everyone could have some guava cake. That was just my grandma for you. Always doing things for her family. We could see that because she enjoyed making things with her hands. I received for Christmas one year the prettiest set of ceramic animals that she had painted herself and then had glazed in a kiln. And they were so beautiful. They had such beautiful colors and shine to them. And I kept them on my bedroom dresser for years and I have them too. And then when she got tired of ceramics, she moved on to crocheting. And she made us a gigantic blanket, just huge. I mean, it was bigger than any bed I've ever seen. And it was made in shades of yellow and two shades of blue. And I think we have that somewhere too. And my mom still has the pot holders that she crocheted another year and keep in the house. And they get pulled out for every family meal, it seems like, and used. Um, but my favorite thing was her ornaments. It seemed like she always made us Christmas ornaments. And I can find those Christmas ornaments on every family tree. In the Kakasi home, in the Serikaku home, in the Albert home. <laughs> sorry, Ron. I just can't stop crying, so I'm really sorry if I'm getting you started. <laughs> you too, Caitlin. <clears throat> When it was time for me to get married, I decided to have a wedding bouquet with flowers that reminded me of each of the important women in my life. For my grandmother, I chose tiny pink roses because there was a giant rose bush at their Lulani house. And I was allowed to pick from that rose bush whenever I wanted. I don't know what that rose bush was, but the closest I can find in a catalog is called a Cecile Bruner. And I remember making little bouquets and giving them to people or probably messing up my grandmother's house in her mind, but she never complained and let me put them everywhere in every room, on every table, <laughs> wherever I wanted to put them. And my grandma did this for my daughter too. 
we used to visit her once a week at my Auntie Eileen at Uncle Roy's house. And she played peekaboo with her and fed her baby bananas whenever she wanted to. In fact, I kind of think she made my aunt and uncle keep them in the house just for Sarah. And when she was older, she would let Sarah cook for her. And so she learned to balance pillow plates on her lap for Sarah, and she learned to eat hot. My daughter insisted that it was hot blueberry and grape soup. She also drank green bean juice without complaint and declared that orange, pea, and cheese sandwiches were very good when my daughter asked how much she liked her food. But the most amazing thing was to watch her do things like zooming. That's what my daughter calls it, zooming. Um, she would take my auntie and uncle's red double-decker bus toys that they had for Ricky and Ron when they were little. Oh, sorry, Kevin. Kevin and Ron. And um, they would zoom them across the dining room table, and they would fall off, or they would crash. And my daughter would laugh and laugh and laugh, and so would my grandma. They laughed together and had so much fun. I hope that Sarah remembers my grandma with the same kind of love and affection that I do. But I thought about it, and if she doesn't, that's OK. Because my grandma's love and caring can be seen in each of her three children. They loved and cared for us, her grandchildren, in the exact same way. We, in turn, are doing or are going to do our best with our children that God gives us. And when we all meet in heaven, her great-grandchildren will recognize her by the same love and caring that they have seen in all of us that she gave to us, and that she gave so freely to everyone around her. I feel like Robin covered things, so I don't need to do this, right? <laughs> Well, I remember my grandmother most of all as a traveler. You saw that from the slideshow presentation. And I honestly can't speak from that from firsthand experience because she never took me along on a trip. I'm just slightly bitter about that. But uh, looking back there um, at that slideshow, I, I honestly don't know if I could have kept up with her anyway. So she probably had her reasons. Um, even though we never took a trip together, grandma still stands out to me as a traveler. Uh, because of the souvenirs that she would bring back. Intricate figurines from Japan, a bola whip from South America, and coins of all different shapes and sizes from around the world. My favorite foreign objects were two pieces of jade from China, one rough and gray, and the other polished, round, and gleaming. These objects were not only tangible proof of where she had been, but they were evidence that she remembered me. I'm so thankful for these objects now because they helped me in remembering her. Later in life, as I transitioned to adulthood, Grandma would take me on trips through her stories. When I would come to visit her in Hawaii or down here in Redlands, we would talk as she finished up her meals. As she talked about her trips, her demeanor would just change completely. It was like a performance piece. She would just remember the dialogue verbatim, and, and she could even copy the intonation of the people who were on those trips along with her. Uh, it was like a one-woman show. She seemed, to have a, she, uh, she seemed to be especially good at uh, recalling the memories that she had with the international friends that she made, of the tour guides that she interacted with, and of, of even the bus drivers that were there. Um, it really struck me as I was replaying these memories in my mind that, that Grandma's interactions were not her stories were not just about the majestic landscapes and places that she saw, but they're about the people that she, that she interacted with and how much she loved uh, uh, meeting them. She really did love people. I was always amazed how she'd come back from a trip and seem like she had a new foreign friend every time. Um, it made me think that Grandma would have been a great CIA operative because of her ability to network internationally. Um, and I don't know the specific details of all her stories, but I remember that they had this pattern of these... Um, these moments that she used to tell, they were kind of the uh, Barbara, I don't know how moments. Um, it could have been something like, 
Barbara, I don't know how you made it back to the tour bus, but you did. Uh, Barbara, I don't know how you negotiated a, the cheapest price on that souvenir, but, but you did somehow. Or, or um, Barbara, I don't know how you're going to fit all those souvenirs in that suitcase, but she did anyway. One thing I do remember clearly is in, that in telling these stories, her dark eyes would gleam like a lake in moonlight, and her laughter would dance into my ears. There's one more journey that I didn't get to take, but that I can bear witness to. Uh, one thing that touched me deeply was, just like Robbie, seeing how, how Grandma interacted with my kids. And there's one story that stands out in particular. My daughter Alice was just beginning to walk, and her me method of training was a little push car that she had that you could either sit in or push behind and, and get your walking legs going. Well, one day she was just sitting around playing, and, and Grandma happened to walk by with her walker, her walker that was gleaming, blue metal that looked like it was made from Wimbledon tennis rackets. It had large wheels, and Alice, when she saw this, her mouth dropped open. She stopped talking, and she even had to lean up against a wall to brace herself from this vision that she'd seen, because in her small, developing mind, that walker was like a supersized stroller, the most awesome push car ever that she'd seen. Well, it didn't take long for Grandma to notice my daughter's obvious uh, yearnings, so she, she motioned her over to come, into the, to come into the walker. And after a little bit of hesitation, Alice got on there, and uh, Grandma sat her in the seat, and she, she went around the house, pushing her all around, doing circles around the, around the house as, as the two of those two chubby-cheeked girls just, just laughed all the way around there. And I'm so thankful for that memory. Well, I'm happy to have all of these memories of Grandma to pick up, take off the shelf, dust off, and just hold in my hand to remember. I'm also so happy that her traveling days aren't over. When Jesus comes again, when he, when he calls her name, when she's reunited with family again, her traveling days will begin once more. And I just hope that we can all keep up. After all, she'll have a new body, like rough jade, refined. Her hip will be healthy, and her sandals will be the same size. She'll be well-rested, too. And even with these changes, I, I think I'll be able to recognize her. I'll just wait and listen for that laughter to dance into my ears and look for those eyes that gleam like a lake in moonlight. With her life, Grandma left me the best souvenir a grandson could get, a glimpse of her best friend Jesus, and a reminder of the great journey that awaits. I can't wait to see where she takes me on our first trip together. A few qualities come to mind when I think of my grandma. She was always so meticulous, and she paid such close attention to detail. She was always generous, but most of all, she was confident in her faith. These are the things that I'll take away from her and hope to emulate in the rest of my life. I remember back when Grandma would come visit us, I was young, but she would always come visit, and I remember this because we had to get my room all clean. We had to get it ready because that meant she was coming to stay with us. It made me happy because then I got to stay with my sister, and I got to share her room with her so Grandma could stay with us. My Grandma was an amazing seamstress. Um, I don't know if you saw in the slideshow, but she made dresses all the time. But it wasn't just dresses that she made. Um, the one thing that I remember her making in particular was um, she made us bedding for our dolls. And it wasn't just, you know, a piece of fabric that she cut out and made, you know, gave to us so we could have a place for our dolls. She stitched everything together by hand. She stuffed the mattresses so that they would be comfortable. 
She just paid attention to every detail and everything was included so that they looked like our beds for our dolls. Grandma was also very meticulous in her cooking. Um, he mentioned that she pulled a cutting board out of her purse to you know, share with everyone. Um, I remember sitting at the table just being amazed by how fast she could chop vegetables. And then you'd look at them and they were all perfect. Everything was the same size, and we just looked at her and thought that a machine had cut those for her. We couldn't believe that that's what she did. Um, another thing, quality of my grandma was she was always so generous, and I think that's been a theme throughout most of our talks. Um, this stuck with her until the very end. When we would visit my grandma after she got sick, she would pull out cookies that she had tucked in her bed and for the longest time she would ask us like do you guys want cookies do you want cookies and we kept thinking like where did she get these cookies from because they would just appear um then we figured out that she would ask when they would offer her cookies she would ask for more than one so that she had one to share with whoever came to visit her um even to the very end grandma always thought about other people along with herself. And the last, the most important thing that I think I'll remember about my grandma was how confident she was in her faith in God. Um, a few weeks before she passed away, we were there with her, and this was one of the things that my grandma always did. We would sit there for 20, 30 minutes, and she wouldn't say anything. And then when we'd get up to leave, that's when she wanted to talk. That's when she wanted to tell us stories or tell us what was going on. And so one day in particular, she stopped us, and she said, did I tell you about the dream I had? And we said, no, what dream did you have, Grandma? And she told us, she said, I had a dream that I was talking to God. And I told him, you know, we were talking, and he said, are you ready? And she said, I'm only ready. She told him this, if you can promise me that I'll be able to see my family again. And then she said, he said, yes, that I'll see everyone again, and then she was comforted by that. And then she told us that she was ready. Um, just hearing that story gives me comfort to know that Grandma was so confident that we, she would see us again. And she knew exactly where she was headed, and she knew that everything would be okay. Um, that challenges me to be more engaged in my faith. And it's just comforting to me to know that she never wavered, and she was always sure that soon we'd all be together again in a better place. get this out of the way right at the beginning here. I thought I was going to be fine. And I see all my family here, and I do see her and all of you. It's a beautiful thing to see. Imagine with me, go with me to a funeral. This one long ago. The reminders of death were everywhere. There was a grave hewn out of rock with a large stone in front of the entrance. There was a grieving family, a cloud of mourners weeping and wailing. There were many gathered there to say goodbye because the one who died was a good man. Such a good man, in fact, that when his family sent word to Jesus requesting assistance when he got sick, they didn't even use the man's name. They simply said, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. And that message went out, but Jesus, Jesus didn't come. Jesus tarried in the place where he was. Day after day went by and still no Jesus. And finally this man, Lazarus, this good man, the one whom Jesus loved, Lazarus, died and still no Jesus. The family was left to plan this funeral, this time to say goodbye. And when Jesus finally showed up, Martha, the sister of this dead man, went out to meet him on the road. Martha met Jesus on the road, and the first thing that she said to him was, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
And I think hidden in her statement there is a little dig, right? A, a little jab, maybe even a mild accusation. Lord, if you had been here, but you weren't, my brother would not have died, but he did. Maybe it seems shocking that this is the first thing that she says to Jesus. But isn't this a cry of every believer for the past 2,000 years? Jesus, where are you? Jesus, you said that you were coming soon. And in that time, so many people, so many good people and faithful people have gathered like our family here today to say goodbye to the ones that they love. Jesus, you said you were coming to take us home. If you had been here, Jesus, if you had been here, my grandmother would not have died. If anyone has ever felt that way, even for a moment, Jesus' response is encouraging. Jesus answers Martha's accusation graciously. He doesn't correct her. He doesn't scold her for her lack of faith. And instead, he just gives her encouragement. He tells her, your brother will rise again. Now, Martha is smart. She has learned well from this teacher. She knows good theology. She answers him, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Now, she, like us, she knew about the resurrection of the righteous. She knew that her brother was a good man who knew God. So she had the hope of seeing him again in the resurrection on the last day. But here, her theology is correct. But she's missing something important and wonderful. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? For believers, yes, we have the promise of the resurrection on the last day. Yes, we know that we will see our grandmother again on that last day. We will once again see all of our loved ones and never be separated. But our hope, our focus does not have to be on some future event. Hope is standing right in front of Martha, talking with her, comforting her. Hope is here with us today. I know that my grandmother will be raised in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Now for all who believe, eternal life begins right now. Our lives are not some clock that counts down the years and the days and the hours until we die. You've got 20 years, 19 years, 18 years, 6 months, 5 months, 4 months, 3 days, 2 days, 1 day. Family and friends, when we put our belief and our hope in Jesus, that clock gets flipped around. And it begins counting forward. From the time that we accepted Jesus and his gift of life, for my grandmother, it was a cooking class. When she met Jesus, and she accepted him, and she took a hold of that faith in his gift of eternal life, I am the resurrection and the life. You have eternal life with me right now. Today, 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 it's another day of life with Jesus. Today, his eye is on the sparrow. Today, he watches me. Today, he is leading all of us from death into eternal life. My grandma, she knew this. We visited with her just before my son Quinn was born. She told us she wanted us to bring the bulletin from church because she wanted to keep up with what God was doing with her church family. She told me she prays every day for her friends in the senior group. Grandma wasn't despairing about her condition, even though it was a terminal diagnosis. She wasn't sit lying there worrying, how many days do I have to live? You saw in the pictures, you heard in the testimonies, she grabbed life with both hands. She went traveling all over the world. 
She wasn't worried about anything but she, because she knew her Savior and she knew that she had eternal life right then. She wanted to experience it all. She knew Jesus. My grandma Barbara, she knew his promises. She believed those promises. And she was intent on living every day for him, even from her bed in hospice care. She had life everlasting in Christ. Why would she waste time and energy worrying about some temporary worldly sleep? She knew her life was in the hands of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. Earthly death could not separate her from the promise and the love of Jesus. Going back to that dusty road outside of Bethany, after giving Martha and giving us those precious words, the present assurance of life everlasting, Jesus stood in front of this tomb. The stone was rolled away, the stench of decay wafted forth. And the one who just declared himself the resurrection and the life came face to face with the full terror and power of death. After a short prayer giving thanks to his father, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out. The strips of cloth binding his body for burial now hanging loose. Jesus called to Lazarus, and even in death, Lazarus responded and followed the voice of Jesus back into life. Now, as, as amazing as this was, the raising of Lazarus from death, this is not the end of the story. This is not the climax of the story. There is something even greater at work here. In the Gospel of John, the divine works of Jesus are never called miracles or works of power. In John, they are called signs. These signs are not done to amaze people with Jesus' power or even to prove that Jesus is God. These are signs. And yes, as wonderful and marvelous as they are, these signs are pointing to something else. They're pointing to something greater. At the very end of the Lazarus story, after Jesus has raised his friend from the, from the dead, some people believe in him but others go off to plot how they're going to kill him. This raising of Lazarus is but one more step on the road to Jesus' death on Calvary. The raising of Lazarus, it points to the cross and to the resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate hope of glory for all who believe. Jesus said of his death and his resurrection, If I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. And another, in another passage, I lay down my life to take it up again. Nobody takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. The raising of Lazarus is a great demonstration of Jesus and his power over death. But it is the cross and the resurrection that seal the deal. All who believe in Jesus... Yes, even though they die, just like Jesus did, will be raised up like him for the glory of God. Jesus died and he rose to life, and he will lead my grandma Barbara from death into life. In today's scripture reading, Lauren read so beautifully from the 23rd, from the 23rd Psalm, the precious words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. These words have brought comfort to so many people, assuring us that the Lord will take care of us and meet our every need. When we are in his care, we do not need to fear anything. Even walking through death's darkest shadows, God our shepherd is with us, and he is comforting us. Now in John chapter 10, one chapter before the story of Lazarus, Jesus identifies himself with this shepherd from Psalm 23. I am the good shepherd. He says in John 10, verse 2, The one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep, the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of him. 
He goes ahead of all of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. The Lord is our shepherd. He knows each of our names. And when he calls us from death into eternal life, he calls us by name. Jesus raised Lazarus by calling to him. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus followed him because he knew the voice of Jesus. Grandma Barbara knew Jesus, her Lord. She knew his voice. Those of you who knew our grandma just from church, you know that she was very, very kind and sweet. But as you heard up here today, there was this other side to her. Right? The family had this nickname for her. They called her the general. And yes, she could be stubborn. She could be demanding. My parents, yes, they'll tell you if they're being honest. She wasn't always easy to live with. But that stubbornness, it also, it also had a good side. It had an inspirational side. Something that I hope to, to duplicate in my life. She stubbornly clung on to her faith. She grabbed onto the hem of Jesus' cloak. She never let go. When she was still strong enough to talk to us during our visits, she told us that it was just so frustrating for her to be lying there in bed. One time she told me, I've been talking to God, and I told the Lord, I can't, I can't do anything for you here in this bed. So I don't know why I'm here. But I trust you, and I know that you, Lord, that you have a reason for me to be here, so I'll do my best to find out what you want me to do here. Even in that bed, she still wanted to follow Jesus. She was still listening for his voice. She was still hanging on his every word. She was still being led by this good shepherd. And now her labors have ended. She is resting peacefully, in the arms of Jesus Christ. But one marvelous, blessed, wonderful day, she will hear Jesus, her Lord, call her by name. And on that day when he calls her by name, she will get up and she will follow him because she knows his voice. She knows her Savior. And he will lead her into the glory of life everlasting. I have many wonderful, wonderful memories and many reasons to be thankful for Grandma Barbara. But, but as I stand here now, what I'm most thankful for is that she taught me to recognize the voice of the Good Shepherd through her life and her faithfulness. I remember the, I remember the first time that I really heard and recognized the voice of Jesus. It was on a mission trip to Mexico. Yeah. It was while traveling, <laughs> appropriate. I was on a mission trip to Mexico during my high school years. This trip was quite expensive and grandma had contributed a considerable sum of money for me to go. My classmates and I, we worked hard, we were helping others, we enjoyed our time getting to know each other and worship God down there in Mexico and something magical happened there in the Mexican desert. It was like heaven was so close that I could taste it. And I remember writing those exact words in my thank you letter to my grandma. Sitting there in our, in, our, in our home in Walla Walla, writing this down. Grandma, it was so amazing. Grandma, I wish you could have been there. Heaven was so close that I could taste it. The call of Jesus became real to me then. And grandma had such a big part in making that happen. Personally, I'm so thankful that I got to tell her this one more time. I got to share this with her a few weeks ago. I just said, Grandma, thank you so much for sponsoring me on those trips so long ago. Because that's when Jesus met me. And he taught me to hear his voice, the way that you hear his voice. Hearing the tributes of, these, of, of, of her other grandkids, whom she loved so much, that's a theme of her life. Grandma taught us how to love, to recognize the voice of Jesus and to follow him. Yes, we love her. Yes, we miss her. And so we grieve. We grieve because it's a sad and it's a terrible thing to have to say goodbye. 
But today we do not grieve like those who have no hope. We know that this goodbye is not forever. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry, with the archangel's shout, and with a blast from the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. My grandma Barbara, her beloved husband, my my grandpa Kiyoshi, all of her kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, all of her friends. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, family and friends, comfort and encourage one another with these words. Now we know today that we are not the only family here who has been touched by death. I guess that everyone here knows the pain in some way, the pain of separation from loved ones, grandparents, parents, brothers or sisters, children. Friends, the only certainty in this world is that we will have to say goodbye to people that we love. But there is another certainty, another guarantee for those who know the voice of the Good Shepherd and who follow his voice. All of these righteous dead, Grandma Barbara, Grandpa Kiyoshi, all of the loved ones represented by every family here today, they will hear the voice of the Son of God And those who hear will live. And those of us who are still living, perhaps us, perhaps our children, perhaps our children's children, all of those remaining and waiting for that blessed day will be caught up together with our loved ones to live with God forever. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. It is a hope sealed and guaranteed by Jesus' words, his promises, and the blood that he shed for us on the cross of Calvary. I'll leave you with one final memory that I have of Grandma. Several years ago, I was was plunking around on a piano. She asked me if I knew a song from the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. It was a song, she said, that she sang with a group of widows who met together in this support group to deal with grief and to support one another. The song was called Until Then. Back then, I wasn't familiar familiar with it, but because she wanted to hear it and sing it, I learned to play this song. She was so happy when she got to sing it. And these words are appropriate during times of grief. My heart can sing when I pause to remember. A heartache here is but a stepping stone. Along a trail that's winding always upward, this troubled world is not my final home. Let us remember together the words of the apostle, encourage one another with these words. May we comfort one another. May we encourage one another so that together we will all listen every day for the call of our good shepherd. Jesus calls us by name. Jesus wants to lead us from death into the certainty of life eternal. And when we listen for his voice, when we follow him, we can have that assurance that assurance of eternal life today. Grandma Barbara knew his voice. She will rest peacefully until he calls her name. And when he calls her, she will get up and follow him to her home in heaven. I know she would want everyone here to be with her, to be caught up with her in the clouds on the day when Jesus returns to take us all home. But until then, Our hearts will go on singing. Until then, with joy, we'll carry on. Until the day our eyes behold that city. Until the day God calls us all home. There are many songs that Mom Barbara loved, but as you look in the program today, you'll find one of them. It's a song about her best friend, 
And you'll see the words there and join me in singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often Please join me as we take it to the Lord in prayer. Our precious, loving God, our Savior, our Good Shepherd, who invites us to call you our friend. God, we are so thankful for the grace that you have given to us to put Barbara Serikaku in all of our lives. We thank you for the way that she showed us the grace and the love and the care that comes from you. And we thank you for the promises that you gave to her, which she passed on to all of us, that you do, in fact, love us, you know us, by name, you have engraved all of us on the palms of your hands. One day, you are coming to reunite us all with those who we love, and to take us all home to our home in heaven. God, we ask that we would, we would learn to listen for your voice. Our ears would be tuned to the sound of your call for us. And that like Barbara, we would know that every day we are living with Jesus Christ. That we have nothing to fear because our shepherd will provide every need. We shall never be in want. 
God, help us to encourage one another, to lift one another up, to pray for one another until that great day when we see you, we see Barbara, we see all of our loved ones together. Keep us until that day, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On behalf of our family, um, I would like to thank all of you for taking the time from your busy schedules and for spending the time with us to, uh, to help us remember mom and to celebrate her life of faith. I'd like to especially thank the uh, caregivers at Gentle Care Guest Home who provided mom with fragrant gardenias, uh, prayed with her, sang with her, and gave her just excellent Christ-like care. I would also like to say thank you to Pastor Horinuchi and to Pastor Udagawa and also to Elder Arakaki for participating today and for uh, giving us words of comfort and hope and inspiration uh, in prayer and in song. Um, I would also like to thank um, Terry, Richard, and Carissa Kunihira, and also Annie Oshiro, uh, Naomi Wysong, Mrs. Udagawa, and Colin Chow, and Chie Newsom for uh, providing uh, some of the delicious looking sushi that uh, we will soon be able to uh, enjoy. I'd also like to give thanks to uh, Annette Nunn uh, for the beautiful flowers, fl floral arrangements that we have here to enjoy. Um, and also, Annette also helped with the food preparation uh, also. I'd like to thank um, Benny Phillips also for providing uh, some of the delicious dessert that uh, we will get to have. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Rick Chang uh, for uh, providing, he made uh, the beautiful uh, hakule and sent it uh, all the way from Hawaii. Uh, he also uh, provided some of the anthuriums that we have in our floral arrangement here also. And so now if you're able, I invite you to stay maybe a few minutes and enjoy some of the, some light refreshments. And also maybe you might share a story that you have um, of mom. So thank you. At this time, we'll be entering into our final tribute. This is uh, a kind of a Japanese tradition. But uh, we're going to ask, uh, we'll be dismissing you, but we'd like to have you come to the far right aisle. And you come around here, pause in front of the picture, and then uh, you can go and greet the family, and then exit this way on your way to the uh, uh, fellowship hall. So at this time, we're going to dismiss uh, this section here first. If you come around here, and then form a line. Thank you.
on a white sandy beach of Hawaii. We were playing in the sun. We were having so much fun on a white sandy beach of Hawaii. Oh, yeah, I know. 